for those of you who haven't been with us, we've been going through the book of First Peter for the last couple of weeks. And today uh, we will be finishing out chapter 2 of First Peter. The title of this morning's sermon is Submitting to Authority. Again, that's 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 to 25. Uh, if you are able, please stand with me out of reverence for God's word, and please give your full and undivided attention to the reading of God's holy words, starting with verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is the word of God. You may be seated. And let's once again bow our heads and ask God to give us help, insight, and illumination into his word. Father, we submit ourselves before you because you are our God, you are our Lord, our Master, and our Father. Just as children submit to their parents, just as servants submit to their masters, Father, we submit ourselves to you. And as we delve into this topic of submitting, not only to you, but to one another and to various positions of authority in our lives, uh, we pray that we would not be led by the passions of our flesh or the thoughts of our minds, but we pray that we would be led by the truth of your word. Uh, Father, this is a topic that uh, we oftentimes want to just skip over, uh, but we pray that uh, you would give us not only the right understanding of this topic, but you would give us uh, the heart to uh, see it as your uh, good rule, your loving command to us. And so uh, we do pray that you would fill us with your spirit, for without your spirit, we are not only able to understand your word, but we are unable to obey your word. And so we pray that you would fill us with your spirit, that we would die to ourselves, and that we would live to righteousness. Father, we pray for the preaching and the hearing of your word this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
there's probably no topic that is more controversial or more sensitive than this topic of submission. Submission is just one of those taboo topics that people oftentimes don't want to talk about in the church. Submission is not something that we like to do or it's something that we don't even like to think about. Our society and culture today, especially among younger uh, people, uh, is very cynical and suspicious of authority. We see uh, that political leaders are oftentimes narcissistic, church leaders are caught in scandals. We see images or videos of police brutality. We see just people in power who use it to abuse it. And especially in our current context right now, hearing our very own president uh, calling COVID-19 a Chinese virus, uh, we see the hatred and the attacks that it inflamed towards Asians and Asian Americans in our nation. Now, he did backpedal somewhat and tweeted that it's very important to protect Asian Americans and that the spreading of the virus is not their fault in any way, shape, or form. However, we all know that it was a little too little too late. So you're probably thinking to yourself, how can I submit to an authority figure who doesn't even actually care about me? Someone who doesn't have my best interests in mind. Someone who may not be seeking to protect me, but may actually be seeking to hurt me? Uh, this is a very valid question. And again, it's something that we don't want to uh, just peruse through our own opinions, but we want to see what God has to say about submitting to even these kinds of authority figures. So uh, as we uh, delve into God's word today, we want to see what God says about submitting to authority, whether you like them or not. So as we go through today's passage, uh, we'll ask ourselves these four questions. First, what does submission mean? Secondly, who should we submit to? Third, why should we submit? And then finally, how are we able to submit? So first, uh, what does submission mean? Submission, uh, it means to live under the order of God-given authority. To live under the order of God-given authority. Uh, the, the verb be subject or submit to, it comes from the Greek word hupotasso, which is a compound verb, which comes from uh, these two words, hupo, which means under, and then tasso, which means to order or place. And so this is actually a military word that refers to soldiers arranging themselves or placing themselves under the orders of the higher officers. Now, can you imagine an army without a general, without a leader, every soldier doing what they individually want to do? No matter how strong or skilled each individual soldier may be, that army ultimately will be a weak army, one that is easily taken over. Or can you imagine a family without any parents, where children uh, essentially are able to do whatever they want, however they please. Could that family be a, a strong family union, family unit? Uh, I believe not. Or can you imagine a company without a boss, where all employees do uh, what is best in their own eyes? Ultimately, that company would not be a strong company. We could all imagine how quickly uh, these uh, groups would end in chaos and crisis. But by God's design, he has raised and placed leaders in all spheres of society, whether it be in the home or in the workplace or even in nations. Uh, you did not choose your leaders. Ultimately, God did. You did not choose your parents. Ultimately, God did. You did not even ultimately choose 
your pastors or your president. Ultimately, God did. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. It says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So although we had a vote, and although our vote counted, in the grand scheme of things, God chose every leader, whether good or bad. God chose every king, every governor, every president. And since all authority comes from God, that is why we are to submit to anyone who is placed in God-given authority over us. In so doing, we submit to God. But on the flip side, rebelling against authority is parallel with rebelling against God. So your submission to God-given authority is ultimately your submission to God himself. But we also need to ask the opposite question. What does submission not mean? Uh, submission does not mean uh, a couple things. Submission first does not mean that we are less intelligent, less human, or lesser an image of God than those whom we submit to. Just like a doctor treating a patient with coronavirus is not better than him or her um, just because that patient uh, listens or follows the instructions of that doctor, a leader is not better of a person uh, than someone who submits to him. If you get pulled over by a police officer and you uh, submit yourself to this police officer, that doesn't mean that this police officer is better than you. It doesn't mean that this police officer is more intelligent than you. It simply means that you are, again, placing yourself under the order of the police officer's position. We can also see, just theologically, that Jesus himself, he was submissive to God the Father. That doesn't mean that Jesus was lesser than God the Father. Uh, Philippians 2, it famously says that Jesus, he was in the very nature of God, and that he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking uh, the very nature of a servant. He humbled himself and became obedient. It doesn't mean that Jesus was lesser than God, but he was arranging himself under God's position and role as a father. Jesus also said in John chapter 6, verse 38, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me not my will but yours be done so this submission is a voluntary choice to recognize or affirm someone's role and submission also submission does not mean total blind obedience submission does not mean that we follow every order of all authority if it leads us into sin verse 17 of our passage today it says honor the emperor but it also says fear god so we honor the emperor we honor governors but we ultimately fear god not men so the general rule for us is that we do submit to all authority but the exception is when submitting to human authority prevents you from submitting to heavenly authority. You obey authority until it forces you to disobey God. And we see uh, examples of this even in the Bible. For example, in Exodus chapter 1, when Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, uh, when he commanded the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua, to kill all of these Hebrew babies. We saw that they did not. Because why? They feared God. Although they honored Pharaoh, although they respected him and his position, they ultimately feared God. So they did not kill these babies, even though they were told to kill babies. Uh, Daniel chapter 1, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, uh, when he uh, overtook Jerusalem, he commanded everyone to eat food that was against 
Israelite law. But we see that Daniel, who was an Israelite, he resolved not to. He did not submit to King Nebuchadnezzar. And so he, in a sense, disobeyed. Uh, he only ate uh, vegetables and water. He did not take upon this new diet that the king was commanding. Also, later in chapter 3 of Daniel, uh, when King Nebuchadnezzar, he builds a golden image. He commanded everyone to bow down to it and worship. But we saw that Daniel's three friends, they did not bow down to this golden image. Uh, they would not bow to any other god. They would only bow down to God alone. And also in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 5, we saw that the apostles, they were arrested for preaching the gospel because uh, it was forbidden uh, to preach about Jesus Christ. Yet, even through arrest, Peter himself, he says in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, we must obey God rather than men. And so, if obeying human authority prevents you from obeying heavenly authority, that is when we do not submit. For example, if a law forces me to preach in favor of sex, same-sex marriage, I can't submit to that because it prevents me from submitting to my heavenly authority, which is the higher authority. So we submit to every human institution so long as it does not lead us into sin. Moving on to our second question, who should we submit to? Who should we submit to? We should submit to all of our leaders. You know, there are various types of leaders. There are parental leaders. There are pastoral leaders. But in this particular passage, we see that Peter talks about political leaders and professional leaders. Leaders in government and leaders in management. Uh, verse 13, it says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Also, your professional leaders. Uh, verse 18, uh, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. So just as children are to submit to their parents and church members are submit to the church elders, citizens are also called to submit to governing leaders and employees are called to submit to their employers. So again, for our current context, for us as citizens, that means that we submit to the President of the United States of America, whether he be Trump or Obama or Bush or Clinton. It means that you submit to your state governor, whether he be Governor Cuomo or Governor Tom Wolf. These leaders, they're obviously in the news a lot these days. And all the more, we need to submit to their orders. For example, there are a lot of stay-at-home orders that are being called upon uh, citizens. Closing of non-essential businesses, limiting travel to life-sustaining uh, places like grocery stores or hospitals. This is a very hard pill to swallow. Uh, it puts a big dent in our finances. You know, I can't imagine being a small business owner at this time. But as leaders, they're trying to protect the wider American people, although it does hurt very many individuals. What happens when people don't submit and follow orders? You know, when we see things on the news, we see a lot of selfish, foolish people like college students in crowded beaches in Florida for spring break. And they probably exacerbated the spread of coronavirus to every state they went back to after their spring break. Now, again, you might object and say, well, what about a president like we have today who doesn't really protect certain people groups like Asian Americans? Uh, or let's say you don't like your boss, like you don't know what my boss is like. He makes me work 18, 19, 20 hours a day and he takes all of my tips. 
Surely God would not call us to submit to, to, submit to such people. Well, actually, uh, if anything, the emperor of Peter's time, as he was writing this letter, I would say, I would submit, was far worse uh, than what you may think of our current president or even your current boss. At the time of this letter, the emperor uh, at the time was Nero. And I mentioned at the beginning of our series through First Peter that Nero, he was a persecutor of Christians. He was a tyrant. And on top of that, this Roman government, it was not a democracy. People did not have a say over who their leaders were like we do. Many of these leaders, they, they jailed Christians. They enslaved them, tortured them, even killed Christians. And yet, God tells Peter to tell believers to submit to even these types of leaders. Peter even takes it further and says not just to submit, but he says to submit with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. So even if your boss is unjust, unfair, Peter's saying, don't disrespect them. Again, this doesn't mean that you follow them into sin, but it means that you endure even being sinned against. And again, this is a very hard pill to swallow. Our human instinct, our passion of our flesh is to rebel against these types of leaders, is to revolt against these types of leaders. But God calls us to not respond out of our flesh. He calls us to respond out of the Spirit of God. Third question, why should we submit? Why should we submit? We see that we should submit first because it is God's will that we be a witness. It is God's will that we be a witness. Let's look at verse 15. It says, For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Again, we do not submit because we like a leader's personality. We submit because it is God's will. If nothing else, we submit because he commands it. And there are only a few places in the Bible that explicitly spells out the will of God. A lot of times we ask the question, like, what is the will of God? What is God's will for my life? There are only a few times in the Bible that the will of God is actually laid out. Uh, two off the top of my mind, uh, they come from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5. In 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. And then 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And also here in verse 15, we see that the will of God is explicitly laid out. It is that you should be a witness, that you should silence the ignorance of foolish people by your submission. Many people have a lot of misconceptions or preconceived notions about Christians. And most of the time, they're wrong. And especially during a season like this, especially during a time of difficulty and suffering, the world is watching the church. The world is watching Christians. Verse 12, Peter says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So Gentiles, the unbelieving world, they are watching the church. They are watching Christians by what we do and by what we don't do, whether they give glory to God or whether they speak against us as evildoers. And I think one unfortunate witness 
this past week was uh, I saw in the news that some churches they refused to submit to the orders of their state governors to stay at home uh, these pastors and churches they were using their freedom and they had service with their churches of many members and unfortunately many members of churches not only got the coronavirus but they died as a result of it brothers and sisters this is not a good witness for the church this is not an example of faith over fear this is actually just an example of stubborn legalism by not submitting to our government leaders but on the flip side I have been seeing good news good witness of Christians Christians setting up food drives for children who aren't able to get their daily lunches because schools are closed I saw people opening their homes uh, to house people who are abruptly told to leave their campuses uh, Christians donating a lot of supplies um, to uh, medical workers this is an example where Gentiles the unbelieving world is watching uh, what Christians do or don't do in terms of uh, their submission at this time I think on an even more general level maybe on a very practical level I think a one way that you can be a good witness is just by being a good worker you know if you are an employee just work hard work well have integrity don't complain be on time be a person of your word that too is a very good witness to your employer and also to your co-workers so it is God's will that we be a witness to the watching world also uh, we submit because we give the grace that we got we give the grace that we got let's look at verses 19 and 20 it says for this is a gracious thing when mindful of God one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly for what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it you endure but when you do good and suffer for it you endure this is a gracious thing in the sight of God two times Peter says that this is a gracious thing what is grace we all know that grace it is a gift that you don't deserve and that's exactly what submission is it is something that you give to someone who does not deserve it so whether your boss uh, who is unfair unjust does not deserve your submission you give it because it is not a deserved thing it is a gracious thing it is a gift to someone who doesn't deserve it whether it be to your governor or your president you give submission as a gift of grace you give a gift to someone who does not deserve it and does that not sound very familiar to something that we have received we have all received grace we have all received a gift that we did not deserve we have all received the grace of God your boss your president may not deserve your submission but God calls us to give it anyway why because God gave us a gift that we did not deserve his very own grace and so this says that we give a gracious thing when when we are mindful of God when we remember the grace of God that we have first received unless you put yourself in this mind state first and foremost you will never be able to give true and respectful submission to your superiors to your authorities why because all that's going in your mind is they don't deserve it they don't deserve it but when we are mindful of God when we are mindful of what God has given to us when we didn't deserve it that is the only mindset that will enable us to give submission to someone else who does not deserve it be mindful of God and the grace that he has given to you so that you could give a gracious thing to someone else who doesn't deserve it 
and at the end of verse 20, Peter says that this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. This is not just for the sight of your employer or your governor or any other authority figure. This is ultimately for the sight of God. Remember that first and foremost, you live before the eyes of God. So often we simply want to live before the eyes of our employer. We want to live just in the sight of other superiors, but we ultimately live before the sight of God. That reminder will help us to submit as God has ultimately shown that to us, doing what pleases God alone. And moving on to our last question, how are we able to submit? How are we able to submit? Uh, we're able to submit because Christ is our example of submission. Let's look at verses 21 to 23. It says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Verses 22 and following, uh, Peter, he's actually uh, summarizing Isaiah chapter 53, where we know that uh, it is one of the greatest prophecies of Jesus Christ and his role as a suffering servant. You know, a lot of times we think about Jesus and uh, we exalt him and we think of him as our, our Lord and Savior and we, we think of him as high and exalted. But at the same time, would we never forget that Jesus was a suffering servant? Jesus suffered for us and he left us an example, a pattern of life. The word example, it's actually the Greek word Hupogramon, which means underwriting. And so, uh, just like young children who oftentimes learn writing by having the alphabet underneath a sheet of paper and they trace letters that are underneath the sheet of paper, uh, Peter is saying that Jesus Christ, he is kind of like uh, someone who we trace someone who we pattern our life after, someone who is our example that we follow. We follow Christ not only in his exaltation, but even in his humiliation, even in his suffering. We follow a suffering servant. And if we're honest with ourselves, we don't want to follow a suffering servant. We want to follow a savior we want to follow someone who gets us out of suffering, but we don't want to follow someone who leads us into suffering. But Peter reminds us that is the call of following Christ. That is what true discipleship is. Discipleship is imitating Christ, following Christ, even to the point of suffering, even if it means submitting to those who are unjust to you. True discipleship is taking up your cross, following him, denying yourself. Again, this is a very hard pill to swallow, but Peter wants to remind us that the way of Christ is the way of the cross. The Apostle Paul, he shares a similar thing in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, he says, I not only want to know the resurrection, the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but also to share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Is that something that we really want to confess, that we want to follow Christ even into injustice, even into suffering, even into death? And if anyone received the most injustice of all, it was Jesus Christ. Because Jesus alone was the only one who was perfect, sinless, completely innocent. The only one who was 
completely falsely accused. Yet he suffered, and he did not revile back. He suffered silently. Peter says that he continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. Jesus said in his mind, vengeance belongs to the Lord. And so Jesus left us an example of perfect submission, one that is far greater than we could ever give because Jesus was perfect and yet he submitted. Even the justice that we receive, in one sense, we are deserving of it because we are all sinners. We are all fallen in our nature. Of course, there are unjust leaders. There are unjust authorities. But no one is righteous before God. Yet Jesus, who was completely righteous, innocent, perfect, even he submitted to unjust authorities. And lastly, not only is Christ our example of submission, but in Christ we experience submission. We experience submission. Verse 24, 25 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but now, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Again, Jesus was not a sinner. Jesus was completely sinless. Yet he bore our sins in his body. On the cross, Jesus took upon our guilt, our shame, our transgressions, and he became the vicarious atonement. He took upon the punishment. He took upon the wrath of God. He took upon injustice so that we could actually live to righteousness. And so Jesus not only leaves us an example of submission, but in our union with Christ, we can also experience that submission. And the question for you is, have you experienced the submission of Christ. I'll say, if you haven't experienced the submission of Christ, if you have not encountered the submission of Christ, everything that I've said to this point, you will be unable to do. You will not be able to submit yourself to unjust authorities because it must come from a heart and a mind, a life that has experienced the submission of God one that has experienced Jesus bearing my sins, my faults, my guilt, and having that taken away, that is the only power that will enable us to submit to those who don't deserve it. The power is that we are able to die to our sins, even our flesh. We're able to die to it and live to righteousness as you are more and more united to Christ. And so Jesus is not only laying out imitation for us, he's laying out application for us. That we don't just follow this example, we actually experience it and we are empowered to be able to follow through with it. It says, Peter says, by his wounds you have been healed. The question for you and I is, have you been healed? Because if you have not been healed, if you remain hurt, then you will not be able to submit to any unjust authorities because they've hurt you. The only being that can heal you is not this authority figure, it is Christ himself. He is the only one that can heal you, heal your heart, and change you, comfort you, so that you will be able to submit even if they never change. Brothers and sisters, we are like strange sheep, but Peter calls us to return to the shepherd. Allow the shepherd, the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, 
to heal you, to comfort you, to remind you that he has bore your sins on the cross. He has taken things that he completely did not deserve. And he allows you to experience that with him, to share in his sufferings with him, so that you who are humiliated, one day you too will be exalted with him in glory. Again, this topic of submission, it's not something that I would choose uh, to preach on, but it is in God's word. It is God's command for us. Would we see that it is in God's good design that we submit to our governing authorities, not simply uh, to allow life to function, but that we would be a greater witness to the world through what we say, through what we think, and through what we do. Let us bow our heads in prayer at this time.